Gregor Mendel. He discovered using uh, maths and stats in a subset of experiments he was doing with the pea plant, some kind of mathematical relationship between the phenotypes he was observing uh, as he crossed peas, uh, hybridization as they called it at that time, from generation to generation. And he could reproduce his observations for uh, several traits, several changes uh, in the way the pea pods, the seeds themselves looked. And that was pretty much what he wrote in his 1865 paper. And uh, this is something which uh, I spent time on. And again, many of you have been, uh, are aware of this uh, from your school days, that there is the principle of dominance, uh, there is segregation, and there is independent assortment. All traits are monogenic, that they are affected only by one locus. And uh, each uh, trait is con controlled by a different set, set of factors. And I have basically spun all of this in the light of what we know in modern biology and modern genetics. You hopefully have a very clear picture of the fact that in a diploid organism, there are a pair of chromosomes called homologous chromosomes. You know that the gene is effectively in the same physical location in both these chromosomes. Uh, you know uh, in a diploid organism, because they are a pair of chromosomes, there is a pair of alleles. And more often than not, both of these alleles are what we call as wild type alleles. They are exactly the same. They produce the same protein. So effectively, we have redundancy uh, within, within our genomes. And I also told you that even though the discovery uh, after many decades of work was published in 1865, it was only around uh, 1900 that uh, there was a sort of a rediscovery of uh, Mendel's work. And uh, Many people reproduced uh, or tried to reproduce these experiments. They succeeded in many of the cases. In many of the other organisms, they failed. So some traits worked, some traits didn't. The traits which followed his laws, today we call them, uh, we call that set of genetics as Mendelian genetics. And the traits which do not follow his laws, and I'll come to this, are basically, again, it's genetics, but it doesn't follow Mendelian genetics, simply because many of the rules which are listed over here are not followed by those genes or by those alleles uh, during the process of heredity, which is transferring of information from generation to generation. Now, around the same time, uh, Charles Darwin, uh, who many of you are aware of, also published his, his book. And he also had worked for many, many decades in trying to collate information. And he basically uh, collated, analyzed, and put all his thoughts in the form of a theory which we know as the theory of evolution. And he said that pheno phenotypic variation exists amongst individuals and the variation is heritable. So heredity came into the picture and those individuals with heritable traits better suited to the environment will survive, which many of you reproduced in, in colloquial language as survival of the fittest, okay? Now, uh, Darwin had no clue about Mendel's work because Mendel's work was in German. Mendel was a monk in a very small monastery. And uh, Darwin was obviously, uh, became fairly famous in UK circles. He was linked to most famous scientists, but obviously he had no idea about what Mendel was doing. Now, we basically had the theory of evolution, which by 1900 had been discussed, uh, agreed upon, not agreed upon. There was a lot of debate going on. And by the year 1900, we had a sudden revelation that there existed literature for the past 35 years, which seemed to indicate the loss governing heredity. And using these two, uh, 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 using these two ideas, over the next 20 or 30 years, many researchers basically uh, put together all these ideas into a single theory, which is called as the modern synthesis. And by around between the 1930s and 1940s, because of uh, influence of a lot of researchers and they are all listed here. This is a very big chapter in, in the development of the field of genetics. Ernst Mayer, uh, Leonard Stebbins, Gaylord Simpson, Dobzhansky, all of these along with uh, Julian Huxley who wrote this very famous book which is shown in green on the right hand side, talked about the modern synthesis. And the modern synthesis, uh, I'm being simplistic over here, but very broadly it brought together Darwin, Darwinian theories of evolution. It brought together all the research done from the 1900s, 
related to Mendelian inheritance. It also brought in uh, ideas of population genetics from Wright, and it also brought in a lot of ideas from Fisher related to statistics. And all of this was put together with a quantitative application into a sort of a hybrid theory called the modern synthesis. Okay. Now you learn about the modern synthesis because it's been effectively dominating all biology, including your textbooks for so many years, uh, pretty much uh, 60 to 80 years at this point. And it is the so-called equivalent of the sort of grand universal theory of how life is going to go about. Okay. And I won't spend too much time on, on this. One of the things which has come about uh, since uh, Mendelian times, and it started as early, it started before 1900, but after 1900, when Mendel's theory started to become established in scientific circles, it was very obvious that when you do genetic experiments, when you do crosses or you do hybridization experiments, and you look at how information is transferred from generation to generation, yes, there were very clear examples where Mendelian laws of segregation, independent assortment, dominance were followed. But they, it also turned out there were, that there were many more examples where this was not really followed. Okay. And we broadly define this entire area of genetics as non-Mendelian genetics with a simple definition that they do not follow Mendelian patterns of, patterns of inheritance. 